Greetings. Welcome to the Simon Property Group second quarter 2022 earnings conference call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. A question and answer session will follow the formal presentation. If anyone should require operator assistance during the conference, please press star zero on your telephone keypad. Please note this conference is being recorded. I will now turn the conference over to your host, Tom Ward, Senior Vice President of Investor Relations. You may begin. Thank you, Kyle, and thank you everyone for joining us this evening. Presenting on today's call is David Simon, Chairman, Chief Executive Officer and President. Also on the call are Brian McDade, Chief Financial Officer, and Adam Roy, Chief Accounting Officer. A quick reminder that statements made during this call may be deemed forward-looking statements within the meaning of the safe harbor of the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act of 1995, and actual results may differ materially due to a variety of risks, uncertainties, and other factors. We refer you to today's press release and our SEC filings for a detailed discussion of the risk factors relating to those forward-looking statements. Please note that this call includes information that may be accurate only as of today's date. Reconciliations of non-GAAP financial measures to the most directly comparable GAAP measures are included within the press release and the supplemental information in today's Form 8K filing. Both the press release and the supplemental information are available on our IR website at investors.simon.com. Our conference call this evening will be limited to one hour. For those who would like to participate in the question and answer session, we ask that you please respect the request to limit yourself to one question. I'm pleased to introduce David Simon. Thank you. Please report our second quarter results. Second quarter funds from operations were $1.1 billion, or $2.96 per share, prior to a non-cash unrealized loss of five cents from a mark-to-market and fair value of publicly held securities. Let me walk you through the big variances uh, for this quarter compared to Q2 of 2021. Our domestic operations had an excellent quarter and contributed 13 cents of growth driven by higher, higher rental income of nine cents strong performance in Simon Brand Ventures and short-term leasing of five cents. TRG contributed four cents of growth, and they were partially offset by higher operating costs of approximately five cents. Our international operations posted strong results in the quarter and increased 10 cents. Lower interest rate or interest expense contributed three cents, and these 26 cents of positive contributions were partially offset by the headwind from a strong U.S. dollar of three cents and a 19 cent lower contribution from our other platform investments, principally from J.C. Penney and a couple of brands within Spark. These costs include these included costs associated with J.C. Penney's launch of new brands, the recent Reebok transaction and the integrated integration costs associated with that, and a softening of sales from our value-oriented brands due to inflationary pressures on, on that consumer. We generated $1.2 billion in free cash flow in the quarter, which was $200 million higher than the first quarter of this year and we have generated $2.2 billion uh, for the first six months of the year. Domestic property NOI increased 3.6% year over year for the quarter and 5.6% for the first half of the year. Portfolio NOI, which includes our international properties, grew 4.6% for the quarter and 6.7% for the first six months. Occupancy at the end of the second quarter was 93.9, an increase of 210 basis points, and TRG was at 93.4%. The number of tenant terminations this year has been at record low levels. Average-based uh, rent increased, average-based minimum rent increased for the third quarter in a row and was at $54 58 cents 
leasing momentum accelerated across our portfolio. We signed nearly 1,300 leases for more than 4 million square feet in a quarter, has signed over 2,200 leases for more than 7 million square feet uh, through the first half of the year, and we have a significant number of leases in our pipeline. Nearly 40% of our total leasing activity in the first six months of the year has been new deal volume. This is up approximately 25% from last year. Retail sales continued. Mall sales volumes for the second quarter were up 7%. Our reported retailer sales per square foot reached another record in the second quarter at $746 per square foot for the malls and the outlets combined, which was an increase of 26%, $674 for the mills, a 29% increase. TRG was at $1,068 per square foot, a 35% increase. We uh, uh, began our national outlet shopping day which was very successful for shoppers and participating retailers, offering a timely, first-of-its-kind power shopping experience. More than 3 million shoppers visited our premium outlets and mills over the shopping weekend. Feedback following the event has been tremendous from both our retailers and consumers. We're already planning next year's event which we expect to be bigger, so please stay tuned on, on that. Our occupancy costs at the end of the quarter are the lowest they've been in seven years, 12.1% of Q2 of 2022. Now, our other platform are investments. Let's talk about it. We were pleased with the results of our, um, of our investments in the platform for the second quarter. They contributed approximately $0.21 cents in FFO. Even though we were down from last year's terrific results, uh, primarily, as I mentioned, continued investment and the inflationary pressures uh, that, uh, that have developed. Based on our distributions, based upon our cash distributions received, we have no cash equity investment in Spark and J.C. Penny. And in fact, we have parlayed our Spark investment uh, into our investment in, AP, in ABG that is now worth over $1 billion. There will be a little more volatility from quarter to quarter when it comes to Spark and J.C. Penny, but please keep in this in the proper perspective. It's all upside from here. During the quarter, we also, as I mentioned, had our mark on our SOHO and lifetime holdings of five cents. A reminder on that, it's a non-cash mark, and we would expect that those, uh, those uh, companies would bounce back. We completed the refinancing of 14 property mortgages during the first half of the year for a total of $1.6 billion at an average interest rate of 3.75%. We reduced our share of total indebtedness by more than $650 million. And once again, our balance sheet strong. We have $8.5 billion of liquidity, $8.5 billion. Today, we announced our dividend of $1.75 per share for the third quarter, a year-over-year -year increase of 17%. This will be payable at the end of uh, the uh, third quarter, September 30th. During the quarter, we repurchased 1.4 million shares of our common stock for $144 million. And let me point out, while other companies in our sector are paying little or no dividends, and issuing equity, we are repeatedly raising our dividend and buying our stock back. We have now returned more than $37 billion of capital to our shareholders since we've been public, $37 billion. 
Now, given our current view of the remainder of the year, we are increasing our full year uh, 2022 comparable FFO guidance from $11.60 to $11.75 per share to the new range of $11.70 to $11.77 per share, which compares to a comparable number of last year of $11.44 per share. This is an increase of $0.10 cents at the bottom end of the range and $0.06 cents at the midpoint of the range. The guidance comes in the face, obviously, of a strong U.S. dollar, rising interest rates, and the inflationary pressures that are, uh, are out there in the marketplace. So let me conclude. I'm pleased with our second quarter results. Our business is strong. The higher income consumers in good shape. Brick and mortar stores are where the shoppers want to be. Uh, pacing e-commerce across the world and the broad retail spectrum. Demand for our space is extremely strong. Worldwide retailers need to grow, and they're doubling down on the U.S. International tourism is returning. Domestic tourism is strong. Our redevelopment pipeline is growing with exciting projects. In addition to our newly announced premium outlet, new developments and expansions. We are experienced at managing our business through volatile periods, including leveraging our existing platform for operating efficiencies, allocating capital appropriately, managing risks. We are not over our skis in any aspect of our business. I encourage you to look at our track record uh, we outperform in these kinds of periods, and we also do some of our best work as well. So thank you, operator. We're ready for any questions um, uh, at this moment. At this time, we will be conducting a question and answer session. If you'd like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. A confirmation tone will indicate your line is in the question queue. You may press star 2 if you'd like to remove your question from the queue. In the interest of time, we ask that you please limit to one question. For participants using speaker equipment, it may be necessary to pick up your handset before pressing the star keys. One moment, please, while we pull for questions. Our first question is from Craig Mailman with Citigroup. Please proceed with your question. Hey, it's actually Michael Billerman here with Craig. Um, good afternoon, David. David, I was wondering if you can talk a little bit about sort of that inflationary pressure um, that's on the retailers that, you know, you're starting to experience firsthand. And obviously your knowledge base of the retailer environment is um, significant. But now actually being on both sides, what can you do as a landlord to help your tenants through this period of time where they are dealing with a lot of inflationary pressures and more inventory? Because um, arguably I know, you know, from a landlord perspective, you want your rent to inflate, and that just makes matters worse. So can you just talk a little bit about the things that you can do to, to, to take share um, and really leverage what you're learning on the retailer side for the benefit of, share, of shareholders? Well, um, thank you, Michael, for that question. So, look, we're not, we're not presumptuous to tell any retailer under any circumstance, how to run their business. So it's really, you know, entirely up to, up to them on how they see fit, how to manage inventory, et cetera. Um, and just our own experience, you know, within Spark, we have several brands. And we did see um, some softness in the more value-oriented brands. And then – and um, – uh, and again, I, we do think that pressure on the consumer with respect to food, housing, um, obviously uh, gas, um, and they and they reined it in. But again, I think the important thing to keep in mind, Michael, is even with that said, we were profitable. We had an unbelievably uh, strong year last year with Penny and and Spark. We're still projecting really high 
EBITDA um, growth for these companies, and even though they're obviously their consumers being cautious, um, back to school so far is off to a good start. Our traffic is actually pretty pretty good, um, and I think you know just from our own operating experience, you know the Spark management team and the Penny, uh, I think do what a lot of retailers do. You know, they rein in, um, you know, they rein in discretionary, you know, capital. They, they watch the uh, overhead. Uh, they really don't close stores because stores are profitable to them. They watch marketing expenses. Um, you know, the, you know the pay, they're, they're very focused on the payback when it comes to return on investment with, uh, with digital, with digital um, spending. So, uh, I, you know, I think the J.C. Penny and Spark team, um, you know, will do kind of similar to what others, but we would never, uh, you know, we would never tell a retailer what they should do. If, if, if they want to compare notes, we're happy to do that, but that's just not our style. And again, and we try to, you know, it's really important. This this other business that we're in is not our, you know, it's a very small part of our business. It's, you know, it's, it's under, you know, 10% at the end of the day. We have no cash investment in it. So I've got, I'm just talking, you know, cash on cash return. Let's go simple math. I've taken distributions, cash distributions in both Spark and Penny that basically has me at a zero net investment. And it will, you know, they'll have volatility with the earnings like any other retailer. And, you know, that's just the way of the world. And it's all upside, frankly. And uh, these businesses are, importantly, and this is very important, they're very well positioned. They're very well positioned to weather if this if this continues, which we kind of expect it to. Uh, they're very well positioned to weather any storm because, as a simple example, uh, J C Penney has a billion three of liquidity. You know, just just to just to throw that out there. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Our next question well, is from. Alexander Goldfarb with Piper Sandler. Please proceed with your question. Hey, uh, uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon out there. Uh, David, a question on, uh, you know, following up on the uh, the retailer platform income. Uh, the NOI this year was like $116 million in the year. Last year was $195 million. So is this some of the volatility that you're talking about? And just curious what drove that mark. And if I can do a footnote for a sort of quasi second question, you mentioned something about the value brands in your retailer platform having trouble, but the other brands, you know, were doing well. Maybe just a little bit more comment on that. Yeah, look, Alex, it, it was 19 cents for the quarter. So we can spend a lot of time on it. But the reason I, I went through it with you is because. Um, you know, there, we have no we have no cash investments in these businesses. So I'm happy to go through it, but let's put it in perspective, please. The the point is, uh, yeah. So let's just talk about Spark, Spark, Nautica, um, Brooks Brothers, uh, Lucky did great above budget, above budget, Eddie Bauer, but above budget. Um, uh, so on. The only um, the only softness we really saw was a little bit in the team market at Aero, uh, a little bit in the you know in the in the fast fashion business in F21, and a little bit in JC Penney. Uh, we and we also, as, as we told everyone at the beginning of the year, we had significant integration cost at Spark with respect to the Reebok transaction. So, um, so that, so, and, and obviously that closed and we saw some of that in the second quarter. So that, that's the status. Everything, 
We also had a management change at F21, which we think will be for the better. That happened, um, I believe, at the beginning of the year. We've got our, uh, we also had our new CEO at, the, at Penny, which also happened uh, last year. So they're absolutely greatly positioned. We got all the confidence in the world, and it's a retailer, and there'll be ups and downs, 19 cents out of $2.96, okay? That's the math. And no, and no investment, no cash investment, okay? So uh, I think I answered it, but if there's something you'd like me to, to dwell on, more than I did, I'm happy to do. Well, I guess you're, that's the one question, right? So it's over, right? Go ahead, Alex. I'll let you, because I like you. Go ahead. What else you got? Okay. Well, then I'll ask you one other question. You guys are always financially savvy, and you buy back stock. Uh, I'm imagining that buying back debt is not attractive, just given where your outstanding debt coupons are, or has the disruptions in the debt markets given you opportunity to buy certain pieces of paper? Well, we, we unencumbered, you know, the reason we have lower interest expense is because we unencumbered assets. We have that flexibility. So we don't like the mortgage market, unlike some others. We just write a check, and we uh, that's why we have lower interest expense compared to last year, and I did the Q over Q, because we can write a check and just unencumber it. Cost. at a lower cost. So we look at that all the time. And that may not be buying debt back, but it's more or less the same thing. It ends in the same result. Thank you. My pleasure. Our next question is from Steve Sakwa with Evercore ISI. Please proceed with your question. Yeah, thanks. Good afternoon. Uh, David, I was wondering if you could provide a little bit more color on the leasing pipeline. It was nice to see the occupancy up as much as it was from Q1 to Q2, um, but could you talk a little bit more about the pipeline, the types of tenants, and, you know, when you sort of look at the, the demand, you know, if you sort of were to try and bifurcate, you know, the portfolio maybe by, by sales, you know, I guess how different is the demand for the really strong centers versus maybe centers in the middle and the lower end of the portfolio? Well, again, you know, our low, lower end is, is just not, you know, just to get – it's a good question because we don't put these numbers in. But, you know, our EBITDA-weighted – this excludes TRG, but our EBITDA-weighted sales are $954 a foot. Um, our average base – rent actually increased 70 basis points, you know, uh, at 73.41 versus 72.87. Um, so, you know, and that's what's driving our NOI, right, because it's the bigger property. So, yeah, you know, look, um, it is across the board. It's also across the retail type. It's restaurants. It's entertainment. Um, it's obviously the high end folks, but it's all and I don't like I don't like naming retailers. Um, you know, Rick does, but you know, it always bothered me and he's not here to do it. So uh but you know, there we have value oriented retailers that are on a on a on very much aggressive uh uh opening um opening uh, program. So it really is across the board. Um, you know, only the 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 best the best properties get the get the high end folks. We're seeing a big rebound in Vegas. Uh, Florida is on fire. California is finding its sea legs. You know, uh, Westchester and Roosevelt Field are all coming back as the suburbs. So uh, Midwest has been stable. So we're seeing it across the board by retailer. Um, by, by price point, by geography, by mix, pretty much across the board. Um, and um, so, I, you know, I mean, it's, I'm not, it's not really granular and you probably wanted names, but, you know, but, but, uh, and we have not seen, thankfully, you know, even with, um, you know, the, uh, 
with with what's going on in the world, we really haven't seen anyone back out of deals of note at all. And um, and I, and I and I said this last quarter. I said it this quarter in my prepared remarks. Um, you know, the U.S. is the let's hope the U.S. we don't screw it up. But the U.S. is you know the bastion of growth for the world. Um, you know, compared to you know because we know China's you know with the way COVID is dealt with there that, that's going to that's going to have ebbs and flows, and, you know, I think our economy is still pretty healthy, uh, consumers in good shape. Uh, you know, I think, I think the growth will continue in the U.S., um, and I think, I think the future is bright here. Our next question is from Adam Kramer with Morgan Stanley. Please proceed with your question. Hey, David. Good afternoon. Um, I just want to drill in a little bit more on, on capital allocation. You know, obviously raised the dividend here again, was active on the buyback in the quarter in just a couple months. Um, and, you know, I, you know, put out these kind of press releases as well about some of the kind of the new and, and renewed development projects. So just wanted to kind of you know, maybe hear, hear you kind of maybe maybe rank or, or just kind of discuss the different options for capital allocation here. And, and you know, I know external growth is is always maybe an option as well. You talked about it last quarter, um, but but maybe if you could just kind of rank the the different options here with with your capital and, and excess free cash flow. Well, look, as a REIT, it'll always be you know the dividend, um, but um, um, so that that would you know I mean it's hard to be to rank it, but I think um, clearly the dividend you know we have to pay out ninety you know, to 95% of our taxable income. There's a difference if you pay out 90 technically versus 95. But you've got to pay out 95% of your taxable income. We're fortunate to be highly, uh, you know, we have taxable income. So we we pay out close to, uh, you know, we're at 100% of our taxable income. That's growing. So that's going to be paid out in cash. Obviously, you know, we've modified that twice in our history. Uh, um, one was COVID, obviously, when we were shut down, uh, and two was in the Great Recession. Um, so that always will rank number one. Uh, two is, you know, we our stock is just, you know, we look at other REITs, we look at other S&P 500 companies, we look at our balance sheet, we look at the fact that we're a cash flow company that generates cash, return on equity. We make deals like Spark that, you know, gets all our money back and we have free cash flow. You know, we can't figure out our value. So the reality is a market, um, you know, we, we have refuted e-commerce taking the malls down. Um, you know, we have withstood COVID. You know, our business is strong, growing in the enclosed mall business. In the enclosed mall business, it's strong, yet, you know, we have naysayers out there that don't believe it. But we believe it, so our stock is cheap, and we're going to keep buying stock back. Uh, and then I think we have a duty, you know, to make our properties as, you know, as efficient and as, and, um, um, as you know, as attractive as we can to the consumer. I mean, obviously, we have to do it with a remind. You know, we have to do it with a with a with a return on investment uh, methodology. I.e., if we had a property and we spent all this money on it, got no return, we wouldn't do it. But where we can do that, that's what we should do, and we will do that. And then the external stuff, I don't really care about. Um, you know, um, and it you know if it, ha if it's there and it makes sense, we'll do it. We have the flexibility to do it, but I'd rather do the dividend, buy our ridiculously cheap stock back, uh, make our existing portfolio better, and then every once in a while we'll have um, you know great new development to do that we'll do it because that also is a core competency of ours. You know that we that you know we'll do, and that's that's how I look at it.
Our next question is from Derek Johnston with Deutsche Bank. Please proceed with your question. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Uh, yeah, so on real estate, um, Phipps Plaza, slated for an October opener relaunch, let's say. Um, so, David, I believe you took roughly a million in NOI offline to develop. So, you know, upon stabilization, you know, what NOI contribution from this project is expected? And really, should we look at this as one of the key earnings accretion blueprints um, looking ahead with other mixed-use projects? Thanks. Yes. Uh, thank, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to focus on real estate. And look, I mean, uh, it fits a fantastic story because, um, you know, we took an old department store. It had, you know, Belks. It was an underperformer, had 14 acres. We couldn't redevelop it. We're going to spend around, you know, $350 million, and we're going to get about a $35 million of NOI, just on that, yeah, on that. But more importantly, well, I shouldn't say more importantly, in addition to that, um, and, uh, you know, eventually we'll show everybody what we did, but we, the leasing momentum that we have created there in terms of uh, re-tenanting, releasing FIPS is staggering. So FIPS, you know, again, I, I, we don't really disclose that, but my guess is the existing property will increase by roughly 30% NOI when we're done with it, if not more, without, you know, without that, not including the, the, the incremental investment I just mentioned, but because of all the retenanting, and more importantly, we will have uh, all of the best brands when we're done with it. And that's ongoing. That won't all be done probably until 24 um, because some of the other existing retailers have leases and they're coming over after that. But um, we're, we're taking a, you know, a quiet mall and making it, go, you know, um, and it's going to be, I think, the hub of activity in a great area in Buckhead. Um, and a lot of good stuff's happening in Lenox at the same time. But yes, the, 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 the simple answer to your question is I would hope to do that in Brea, you know, Ross Park, you know, go down the list. But yeah, we, ha we have a, a ton of those opportunities. And, you know, the mixed use, um, you know, mo most of our real estate is really well located. Um, and, you know, the, the adding the mixed-use components, especially your residential, you know, really does add a lot of, you know, synergy, a lot of, a lot of uh, mojo to the property. So we hope for that to continue. Thanks. Sure. Our next question is from Greg McGinnis with Scotiabank. Please proceed with your question. Hey, David. Uh, hopefully an easy two-parter for you, but um, how has the broader economic environment adjusted uh, the process for adding projects to the development pipeline, and how have increases in construction costs and labor shortages impacted uh, pipeline returns and timelines? You know, let, let me talk timelines. The only, the, the biggest issue that we're having on timelines is in what I call in the restaurant industry um, in that, you know, some of the equipment required to open restaurants does have a backlog. Um, this, the, the storefront improvement is increasing. Uh, obviously, tenants are very, very focused on that, not affecting timing, uh, but it is something that we're watching uh, it has not affected deal flow or deal economics. Uh, and I do think um, the good news when it comes to, you know, at least materials, uh, it, you know, we are, we are at a lower level than we were a few months ago. So on a timing side, it's really just um, equipment, 
four restaurants. Uh, on our return development, not, not, n nothing, you know, yeah, we have a little bit more here and there, but nothing that um, is going to, you know, ultimately decide to go from, you know, a go project to a, to a negative. If, if anything, <coughs> in a lot of these cases, we're planning on higher income, so they seem to, they seem to be getting basically the same returns. But we're, we're not, we're not, nothing's changed dramatically that would, uh, you know, suddenly scratch a project. If I could just add just real quick to that, um, what about now that you have a, you know, lower price stock, so investment in the stock versus, you know, redevelopment expense, deciding between I the think, two? I think we can do both. I think we can. And, again, I mean, I, some of these things, you know, we, we really want folks to focus on. Others in our sector, you know, when you put us in perspective, you know, we're buying stock back, we're not issuing equity, and we're raising our dividend. I don't, there are very few, and you can define the sector any way you want, and I don't want, but there's not many, you know, we're just built a little bit differently, even though, you know, we may, we may be in the same industry, we, we're built differently, okay? And um, so, so that, that's the important point, and that's why we really try to emphasize it much like, you know, we emphasize Spark about some of the, you know, mathematical differences about our company beyond just, oh, we're in the same business. It, it, it is math. At the end of the day, you gotta, you got to run your business so the math works. Um, but, yeah, I like buying our stock back, but, you know, like I said, I do think we have a duty to – continue to invest in our portfolio as long as we see the right return on investment on that. Thanks, David. Sure. Our next question is from Mike Muller with J.P. Morgan. Please proceed with your question. Yeah, hi. Um, the year-over-year -year ABR per square foot comp at TRG looks pretty strong at about up 5%. Is there anything out of the ordinary driving that? Uh, no, I just think uh, we've worked well together, and you know uh, the portfolio is in great shape, and um, you know, and, and um, driving, you know, and and it, and we're driving growth out of, out of it um, collectively, so it's all good. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from Flores Van Dykum with Compass Point. Please proceed. Please proceed with your question. Uh, thanks for taking my question, guys. Um, last quarter, uh, you indicated the, your uh, signed not open pipeline was around 200 basis points, I believe, and it was a little bit higher in the malls than the outlets. I was curious if you can give an update on that. And also maybe, David, you know, you've, got, you've got these retailers. Are you, you know, everybody's been talking about a glut of inventory. Uh, will you create outlets, stores for some of your retailers? And where else are you seeing some of the demand for the outlets coming from? Is there more luxury potentially that's coming to the outlets or, or homewares? Or where, what other uh, segments do you think will expand into the outlet business? Well, uh, let, let's try and answer the – that was very clever to get two questions <laughs> So I'll uh, try and answer the first, and then I'll take a shot at the second part. Uh, Flores, we're still hovering right around 200 basis points uh, in, uh, in the second quarter. And then, okay. Uh, well, and then I would say, you know, th th there's no – I mean, there th some of these the big, big retailers had a glut of inventory. Um, um, we we – the luxury guys do not have a glut of inventory, okay? So they're, they're, that's not happening. Um, and, um, you know, to the extent that, um, uh, you know, Spark, the Spark brands, by and large, are already in a, a lot of outlets, some of ours. You know, a lot are not ours. Um, there's really no change in plan. You know, maybe there's been a few – you know, some of the brands, uh, not just Spark, but elsewhere, have had a few pop-ups. But 
that ebbs and flows. I, I don't think Florist, there's any real interesting dynamic going on that. Um, you know, um, and there's not there's not a lot of folks with a glut of inventory as far as I as far as I can see. I mean, yeah, obviously some bigger bigger folks, but most of those guys want to flush it through their existing system. And there is no the higher end folks. There's no glut of inventory that we see. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. Our next question is from Vince Tiboni with Green Street. Please proceed with your question. Hi, good evening. Um, could you drill down a little more on sales trends during the quarter? Uh, did sales start to slow down at all in the back half of the quarter as inflation accelerated and rece recession fears increased? Uh, no, no, not not really. Um, so it was, um, I mean, uh, not not really. We didn't we didn't really. In fact, in July, in a lot of cases, we saw we saw you know a little bit better results recently. So you know, n n no real trend there, um, Vince. No, that's good. Good to hear. It's helpful. Um, and then just maybe one follow up to that: Are you seeing a, any difference in tenant sales performance between the higher end and luxury tenants versus? <clears throat> The more made three brands, um, presumably the, the latter would be you know, more impacted by the in, in inflation issues. I would absolutely, you know, we, we definitely have seen that, um, you know, where the, where the value-oriented retailers or, you know, you know we, there, there's no question the consumer um, that um, – you know, is pressed on discretionary income, is dealing with a, you know, very difficult situation with food, uh, food, obviously gas, um, you know, and, and dwelling. So, um, and, and, you know, they, you know, they're, they're reining in their, their spend. So there's no question about that. Um, but we're we're and we're but we haven't really seen that at all um, in you know kind of the better brands and like I mentioned earlier, Spark, you know like the Brooks Brothers, the Luckies of the world are doing very well. But where you do see it a little bit is you know in the in the you know in the in the value oriented retailer or or, or the younger consumer, you know that suddenly you know gas is you know taken a lot out of their out of their pocket. Uh, pocketbook. Great. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Our next question is from Craig Schmidt with Bank of America. Please proceed with your question. Oh, great. Thanks. Um, uh, domestic same strain OI was up 3.6% compared to 75 It looks like a lot of it was due to the tougher comps in second quarter. And in that case, it seems like the comps only get more difficult third and fourth quarter. Is that why the same story and I number might actually be going down for the second half of the year, or is, is it the macro factors? No, I mean, Craig, uh, we were really clear. We're actually outperforming what we thought. You know, we, you know, Q1 of, um, uh, Q1 of last year uh, had the big benefit of uh, going up against COVID, right? So, no, we were really, really clear what we saw overall, and we've been outperforming. And you know, I think we'll outperform our initial guidance of two percent. But, um, um, but, but that's you know nothing, nothing other than that. Um, for normal seasonality of the business, Greg. Yeah. yeah, I mean this, this is this is better than our plan. And it's consistent with our plan, even though the trend is above our plan. So the, your your leasing year to date, if you will, is strong enough that you think that um, has it continued in July, um, and do you think it could continue despite some of the macro factors? Well, I said that several times. Yes, the answer is. We're, our, we have not, our pipeline is as strong as it's been. We're doing a bunch of new deals. Now, Craig, you know, 
when you sign a lease, the store doesn't open tomorrow in a lot of cases. Um, and and this, this is really, really important for everyone to understand. We're very optimistic because a lot of the leasing that we've done really doesn't open until 23, 24. So not only are we outperforming our budget this year, off a strong last year, but we actually feel really good that as we get these stores open that we leased to over the last six, nine months, that, you know, that will continue to fuel positive comp and a lot. Thank you, Craig. Thank you. Our next question is from Michael Goldsmith with UBS. Please proceed with your question. Good evening. Thanks a lot for taking my question. On the guidance, the low end of the range has come up, the high end relatively flat at a time when you're seeing softening of sales at your lower income brands. So the, my question is, what's implied for the performance of the base business in the second half kind of relative to what you saw in the domestic and international operations in the second quarter? Maybe said another way, how sensitive is your performance to the macro environment and what's the outlook for percentage rents? Well, it's a very, you know, look, I think we feel uh, really positive about um, the portfolio, the results that will generate from the portfolio, and again, the, the um, higher income con consumer is still spending money. And if anything, I think if you go back in history and Actually, Tom did a very good piece on that. If any of you are interested, you can call Tom. He'll go through it with you. Our business and our industry actually tend to outperform uh, during recessionary environments if, to the extent that we get there, and maybe we're in one, maybe we're not. I'll stay out of that political definition, uh, primarily because the, you know, the big ticket items – you know, suddenly go toward kind of what we sell at our property. So, um, um, and that position, that's kind of a somewhat of an insurance policy, and it's historically always proved to be, you know, very, you know, very positive. So even in every recession, other than COVID, when we were told to shut down, our cash flow from our properties was flat. It did not decrease. Um, so Tom has a great paper on it. If you're interested, we'll charge you, but we'll we'll give you the data. Uh, I think the same case will be here. You know, we'll, you know, if if we do get into a full blown recession, our cash flow will be positive. It won't maybe grow as high. We'll have some exposure on sales, um, but we do see you know, the big tickets kind of go away and they move toward, um, you know, move toward the items that, that we sell on our properties. Um, and, again, in, I think you asked something about Spark. You know, again, it's really just a couple of the brands. It's also going against a great year. And, again, let's have a bigger picture view of that business. Thank you. Our next question is from Juan Sanabria with BMO Capital Markets. Please proceed with your question. Hi, good afternoon. Just wanted to ask with regards to the months and month leases uh, that are still on the books are a little bit higher than the historical average. Should we expect that to stay there? Or are you still comfortable kind of out for higher rents or how are you thinking current context? Yeah, I, I think, um, that's more a function of documentation than, than deal-making in that we don't put that done until it's signed. And a lot of our um, bigger renewals have been done over the last two, three, four months, and all that's being documented. So I, I would expect that that number would continue to go down. But we have no, you know, we have no fear in that number. Thank you. Thank you. 
Our next question is from Handel St. Just with Mizuho. Please proceed with your question. Hey there, good afternoon. Uh, Dave, I get a question on a follow-up on the seasonality of, of NOI the first half of this year. Uh, second quarter NOI is lower than the first quarter based on supplementals in both periods, which is unusual. Uh, how are operating expenses impacting uh, typical seasonality? And, and what's, what's embedded in the percent stands for the NOI guide profit this year? Thanks. Yeah, we, I didn't, we didn't gather your first question. Could you please repeat it? First question was on the impact of seasonality and the sequential NOI for 1Q to 2Q. 2Q looked uh, lower than 1Q, uh, which uh, is unusual. And so I was actually asking how operating expenses. I, I think, I, I, I don't, I don't, um, Yeah, I don't. I don't think the NOI is lower quarter over quarter, uh, sequentially quarter over quarter. You know, you did, we did. We do have. You know, a lot of companies hit an overage rent in the first quarter because their leases end in January 31. So, you know, you 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 pick some of that up in 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 Q1, but that's. That's not, uh, you know, that that would be the only reason. And on OPEX, any color on how it might be impacting seasonality of what's, uh, what's your expectation or embedded in the 2% same sort of I got mentioned? We, I, we, I'm, I, I, again, I'm sorry, but your connection's really not so, so good. Uh, we're not really uh, seeing much uh, inflation just yet in operating expenses. Uh, as you think about us, we've, we've got long-term contracts that protect us from material increases. I mean, we did we did increase our operating expenses five cents. You know, we did hit a negative five cents for the quarter. Our next question is from Ki Bin Kim with Truist Securities. Please proceed with your question. Thanks. Um, just to follow up on Handel's question, uh, your NOI from Clayfear and HBS uh, also increased pretty significantly in 2Q over Q1. I was just curious, uh, curious about how much of that is sustainable in a run rate, from a run rate perspective or if there's some one-time items. Well, no. Uh, Clayfear it was shut down last quarter, so this is kind of more now, I mean, last year at this quarter. So this is, they're still not firing on all cylinders, so we'd expect future growth here. So comparing to Q2 of 21 compared to Q2 of 22, Q2 of 21, they were under a lot of, restrictions and in some cases closed. And HBS is so small, it's, you know, it's insignificant. Um, but there's not real, there's no real change there. We, it's a, it's a lease, um, there, it's a lease that pays a certain amount of rent every month. So it's, it's, there's no, very little growth, in, you know, other than like the, the normal step ups, very small. So the change is okay. I actually meant sequentially. You meant, I actually meant sequentially. I actually meant that sequentially it increased by, I think, $10 million or so. Uh, well, you know, we did a restructuring, so, you know, that's, that's um, you know, that's, that's, that's part of it. And they're doing better, quite honestly. They announced results and, and strong results. So I think you're seeing that starting to come through our results as well. Okay, and I'm not sure if I missed it or not, but can you, any kind of commentary you can share on what the lease spreads look like in 2Q? And given that you're close to 94% occupancy, uh, as you continue to increase with that, you know, what kind of pricing power do you expect to gain um, when you start to reach 95 or 96% occupancy? Well, rents are all moving in the right direction, and, and our spreads are moving in the right direction, too. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from Linda Sai with Jefferies. Please proceed with your question. 
Hi, thanks for taking my question. Um, on the guidance, original guidance was domestic NOI of 2% growth, and year-to-date it's 5.6%. So is there any update to the 2%? Uh, as we've said for several years, we do not update that. Um, you know, we give you our best guess at the beginning of the year. It's all part of our plan. We disclose what we think the number is, but we do not <coughs> update it um, quarter to quarter. Other than, as as we've said, um, you know, we're pretty confident we're going to beat our initial expectations. Got it. And then, could you talk about what you're most focused on from an ESG perspective in 2022, and you know, what are some initiatives where we might see some progress? Well, we, we I mean, that's a, you know, I don't have enough time to go through it, um, but obviously, we're it's across the enterprise, um, you know, uh, and obviously from an operating point of view. Uh, a lot of it continues to, you know, to be focused on reducing our carbon footprint, but uh, and and giving back to the communities, which we do in in a lot of different ways. But it's a, you know, that's a it's a ve that's a very long. Please read our report. Um, if you don't have it, there's a link. I'm sure Tom can give it to you. But it's, you know, it's certainly it's certainly focused on, you know, the big item is focusing on reducing our carbon footprint. Thank you. Thank you. We okay, have reached so I, the, oh, sorry. We sorry, have reached ahead. the end of the question and answer session, and I will now turn the call over to Mr. David Simon for closing remarks. Okay, thank you. I believe that's our allotted time. So, um, you know, thanks for um, everybody's questions, and um, any, any follow-up, please... Uh, Call Tom and Brian. Thank you. This concludes today's conference, and you may disconnect your lines at this time. Thank you for your participation.